Welcome to the Echo Oscar Delta podcast, where we talk to Navy EOD techs and hear the stories that they want to share. All ideas, thoughts, and statements are those of the guest and the host of Echo Oscar Delta, and not of Navy EOD or Navy as a whole. All right, today on the Echo Oscar Delta podcast, we have, uh, again, a little bit of a, a different one. We have Chris, better known as Swampy, um, coming with us, and he's uh, been doing a lot of work in Ukraine for quite a while. Uh, Swampy, Chris, whichever you prefer, uh, how about you give us a little bit of a background on how you got started in this and then ended up in, in Ukraine doing work? Hi, John. Thank you for having me on. Um, yeah, so my name's Chris Garrett. I'm uh, 39. I'm from the United Kingdom, from a small island called the Isle of Man. Uh, not many people really know oh, it. But there we go. I've heard of um, it. And yeah, so I've been volunteering in Ukraine since uh, the last week of August or first week of September 2014. Um, I was prior British military uh, before this, but only for a year. I had a knee injury while I was in training and then left. I had nothing to do with bomb disposal at the time, um, but then I started to pay attention and get involved with the Kren National Liberation Army and the uh, Kren National Union out in uh, in Myanmar, in Kren State, um, in the early 2000s. And then it just kind of spiraled on from there. I, it led me to Ukraine. And uh, yeah, I've been, uh, I did three and a half years the first time around in Ukraine and then came out. And then after Russia's full invasion in February last year, I then came in and I've only been out since about mid-March this year. Um, okay. And then I had another trip back in July. So at the moment, it's a, it's a bit of bouncing uh, while we get some family stuff out of the way. Gotcha. Uh, getting into the the landmine and the and the UXO kind of uh uh, removal and and everything. How, how did you end up kind of really diving into that and and then working? So I um, while I was volunteering while I was volunteering out in Southeast Asia, um, I met a couple of VOD techs that were trying to set up a what can only be described as a clandestine uh, EOD operation in Myanmar. Um, obviously, there's no. There's no legal framework for us to be able to work in Karen State since the, the Burmese junta are trying to kill the, the ethnic groups in those areas. Um, yeah. And I met these people in a village where I'd volunteered before. And I just, I realized the the need for it. At the time, you, uh, Burma was classed as one of the most heavily landmine countries on the planet. Now it's succeeded by, um, by Ukraine. Um, and because these guys had never been into Myanmar before, they didn't know the people, they didn't know the place very well. Uh, they didn't know how slow things went either. Um, so I, I decided to stay on with them and just ask them in return, you know, would they, would they teach me as much as they could? So um, I got my training on the ground uh, from these EOD techs. And, you know, they're, they're very good guys. The, the guy who set the project up, he had been the country manager for a number of large humanitarian mine action organizations. So I really got some very good on the ground knowledge and on the ground skills. And then eventually, as I say, that just, uh, that led me on to going to Ukraine uh, to, to help out in whatever way I could. That's awesome. That's a, uh, I was talking with somebody, we were talking about how we're going to be doing this, this podcast and, and uh, you know, everybody assumes that people that deal with explosives type things, get their normal training going through the military and all that. But there's actually a, a, a good amount of people who, who do it a, a similar way, who start with a uh, humanitarian man at mine action organizations and, and, and get that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely seen as the black sheep within the humanitarian mine action organizations because I started off working <laughs> in a quite clandestine operation. Um, <laughs> but in a way, it's been quite nice as well because it's meant that I've not been confined by SOPs that don't always apply in certain situations. Um, right. And it's the same from not having it from a military background as well. What I've found now and, and I mean absolutely no disrespect to any anyone within the UD community that's done it through the military route. Um, but what's happened since the Afghan and the Iraq conflicts is everything's become very IED heavy. 
Um, the reality is in on, in the conflict in Ukraine, it's not. We're back to landmines, um, but sheer volumes of them is astronomical. Yeah, I mean, I, I would 100% agree that uh, we have we focused on what was what was out there, right? That sure. that we're being tasked with on the daily, um, but now that I, I think we're starting to see that too. Now that uh, other things in the world that aren't heavy IED related, we're starting to get back a little more to uh, what what's some of the conventional stuff and potentially even conventional slash turning it to how do you use conventional in a different way? Um, sure. Which yeah. I'm sure you'll tell about, uh, you know, different things that you've seen in Ukraine. Um, and actually, you know, I guess going into that. So, so what, what have you seen? Well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, no, um, go <laughs> so I actually, you know, you talked about being in, in Ukraine since 2014. And I think, you know, it wasn't while well, people knew about stuff going on over there, it wasn't a big deal until really recently. So what's happened, uh, it, like 2014 up to this, this current conflict. And then how, how have you seen since you've been there before and after, how have you seen that change and in, in the upticks on different things? Okay. Um, so, I mean, when I joined in 2014, I'd been invited, um, well, asked to, to come over by some friends that I, I knew in Kiev. And I didn't really know what the situation was on the ground till I got out of the jungle. So I, I'd been in the jungle doing clearance on a couple of villages in Burma from January through till August 2014. So once I, unfortunately, the Wi-Fi in the jungle is terrible. Don't know. Who, who sorts that? Um, so when I when I came out of the jungle and started actually checking my emails and messages properly, I had a pile of messages backed up explaining what had happened. Obviously, Crimea had been taken over. There was fighting in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk regions, and the the guys were just asking, "Look, it's, can you come over? Can you come and help with anything? We have guys going to the front line with no medical training, There's, with no idea of uh, basic mine recognition." They have people that fired 10 rounds for an AK in their life and were then being thrown into the front line. You know, it was, it was a really bad situation. And um, prior prior to um, the conflict starting in 2014, uh, since Ukraine had won its independence, it had never been at war with anyone. You know, it had a very small standing army. The, the level of training was very bad. The equipment was um, not so great, should we say. Um, so I had got back to the UK in August and just realized my bags are still packed. I've just come out of the jungle. Don't want to go home yet. Um, so let's, let's go somewhere else. Uh, so I, I planned to go out to Ukraine for three months, uh, which turned into three and a half years. Um, but when I got to Ukraine, I tried contacting the national police, to speak to their bomb disposal team. Um, and at the time I couldn't find anyone that spoke English. I spoke to people from the army, uh, from the National Guard, from the Marines. No one spoke English uh, mm. or, or wanted to give me the time of day. And it was the same with the state emergency services, which also have their own demining unit, uh, the SNS. Um, so it left me with a few difficult choices, really. I could either hang around as a sole person, as a volunteer, and see what I could do, which I knew wasn't really going to get much done. Um, or I could look to one of the volunteer battalions and join on with them. So I ended up having a look at a couple of the volunteer battalions. I picked one that uh, then became amalgamated into the National Guard. So I was in the National Guard, but the legitimate framework for having foreign nationals on the front line uh, or as part of the military was still not there. So we were, there was maybe 10 or 11 guys in my unit that were foreigners um, and we were all just amalgamated into a, a small foreign reconnaissance team. So I joined with the idea of being there to clear landmines, uh, but the reality is 50% of the work was reconnaissance work, fighting, um, and then just trying to do as much EOD as I could in the middle of it. Um, as time went on, that progressed more that I was um, 
teaching more about uh, basic mine awareness, basic mine clearance. Um, and then I ended up, when the, when the conflict became quite stagnant at the back end of 2016, a lot of the foreigners had gone home at this point, and there was only three of us left. So we were then amalgamated onto the scout sniper team, and stayed, I stayed with them until November 2017, and then, and then left. Um, but back then, the the mine use was quite basic. You know, you were you were seeing basic laying of mines. There was no rhyme or reason to how it was done, um, okay. and that that was on both sides. Um, the booby trapping has always been quite standard, and that's just a knock-on effect from people that were in the Soviet military. Um, if you even if you go into YouTube, you can find a lot of videos of Russian soldiers literally giving lessons and demonstrations on on 101 ways to booby trap an F1 grenade. You know, um, and there, there literally is 101 ways to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and of course. This has a knock-on effect. Social media has a knock-on effect. So as the conflict continued from, from 2014 up to present day, with social media, you've had this massive influx of people posting videos of laying mines, laying booby traps, laying IEDs, uh, producing them, um, and also clearing them. And it's created this very dangerous precedent where anyone thinks they can go out and lay a mine or make a booby trap, but also everyone thinks that they can go out and remove one. Um, and it's yeah. both sides kill, you know? So. Yeah. I've, I've actually seen that on Instagram. There's a, there's several accounts of people that have really no training in it going out and trying to thinking that they do essentially, just like you're saying. Yeah. So, as you started uh, getting into this, the the conflict during the the invasion that's going on right now, um, how did you see the increase in use? Because I I believe you said that there was a a substantial increase in use of landmines and and everything. Yes, yeah, there has been. Um, I mean, just, just before we even get into it, at the moment, they're now saying that Ukraine is, they believe it to be the most heavily mined country on the planet. Well, right. Myanmar, Burma, uh, that was estimated to have roughly 66.5 million. I think it would be totally reasonable to say that Ukraine, this isn't written down anyway, but I, I would say it's totally reasonable to say that we're probably looking at seven to eight million landmines wow. up, in, up in the country. Um, how many have been cleared? I couldn't say. Um, but I mean, even if you just look at things like uh, PFM, uh, we don't have the official numbers of what was in Russia's stockpile, uh, but we know what Ukraine had left in uh, 2020, of which they still had 3.6 million, 3.3 or 3.6 million PFM loaded into Oregon rockets alone. And that's just butterfly mines, you know, yeah. 3.3 million. So, um, you know, it's the use has been astronomical. Uh, the sheer amount of landmines that we're finding on the front line, um, it gets to a point where you don't look at a section of minefield and go, oh, I'm going to clear all of this. It's just, what's the job? Do we need a route through it? We need a route through it. Bang, punch a route through it. And that's done. The rest, as long as it's marked and mapped, uh, can stay until we, we have the time and the ability to remove them. Um, you know, I, six years ago, seven years ago, I wouldn't have thought too much about going up to a TM62 tank mine and unscrewing the fuse. Now everything has to be done remotely uh, yeah. because it's it's that chance of one in 100 or one in 10,000 being booby trapped. It's that one that's going to catch you out. Uh, right. And, and as you were saying as well, uh, there is there is a number of accounts of people that are in country, uh, both Ukrainian and foreign, um, that are doing bits of mine clearance. Um, I have reached out to a few of these people in the past and said, look, you really need to take a look at your SOPs. Um, there's no blame game or anything, but you need to understand that the, the sheer level of booby trapping um, is going to keep catching people out. Um, an argument that I've heard for this is, oh, well, it's a mechanically laid field. You know, it's being driven along with a vehicle where tank mines have been slid out 
the back of a ramp. That's great until you get to a point where they decide to stop the vehicle, guy gets out, quickly booby traps one and carries on. And I know it's happened. So you could have a belt of 4,000 mines across a couple of fields or a field. There only needs to be one booby trap to catch you out. So. Yeah, that's, that is something that uh, I think without training, whether it's, it's formal going through, you know, an official EOD school in a whatever country or getting trained by someone who has had formal training in a, in a like a curriculum. Uh, yeah. That is something that is uh, often people think we're too safe, but uh, even a lot of us being too safe have, have been hit. So sure. it's, yeah, yeah. man, it, like you said, it only takes that one. That's, that's a weird mentality to have on the, the other side. <laughs> I mean, I, so I, I took formal um, civilian IMAS qualifications in Kosovo, I think it was 2016. Um, but because that's based around humanitarian demining, um, and a lot of this work that I've been doing is either for the police or for the military, um, it's having to find that happy medium of, okay, this SOP works, this SOP doesn't work. These safety standards are good to this point. But then from this, I have to look at it and go, well, what's actually safer for me on the ground? Um, right. It leads to a lot of armchair critics. Fire and yeah. So it's good. For right. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, pops into your, your emails and whatnot all the time. Somebody saying, oh, no, you're I mean, doing this out all wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the things I noticed, you know, as I, as I look at um, a lot of the stuff you've done and, and, and a lot of uh, a lot of other people that are that are over there as well. Uh, you know, I, I asked this question not because well, I asked this question because I know a lot of people who are with, um, you know, large military organizations won't necessarily have the same constraints that you do in this terms. So uh, there, there's a lot of remote polling and then taking care of stuff on the backside. And I won't get into exactly how you take care of that for obvious reasons. But, um, you know, one of the questions that could be asked is, well, why don't you just throw a little charge on it and make it go away? Um, I suspect that that has a little bit to deal with, you know, taking aside if you don't want someone to know you're necessarily play it in the minefield. Sure. Um, also the access to massive quantities of explosives that would be needed to do that. If you're trying to do that for every single mine that, like you said, potentially seven to 8 million mines out there. I mean, um, because sorry, got the, uh, the jets coming over from Hill Air Force Base at the moment. It's great. I, I come back to the US to see my partner and, and take a break. And I just have this PTSD induced yeah. flight path over the house. Uh, it's great. Uh, we don't we don't hear too many jets in Ukraine. And when you do, you know, it's going to either be a very good or a very bad day. Um, there we go. OK. Um, yeah, so you're you're correct on both accounts. Sir. So sometimes, depending on where we're working, we don't want to we don't want to start deming stuff, uh, not immediately. Um, generally, there's been a number of comments on one of the posts I put up, and you'll see me probing around a PMM2. Um, so this was on a forest track in the forest below Cremina, which is very heavily contested. And the entire place is a minefield. The forest and the forest tracks are very heavily mined by the Russians. And what we did start to see later on as I was working there towards November, December was daisy chain mines with, mm -hmm. using deck cord. Um, so you just have a spool of a little bunch of deck cord underneath a PMM1 or a PMM2. And because it's all very sandy soil there, uh, you have about an inch of, inch of soil uh, and grass at the surface land. And once you get underneath, it's just, it's like building sand. It's really, really pure. And because of that, it's very easy for them to quickly dig stuff in. Um, and what we were finding was uh, PMM1 and PMM2 then daisy chained and linked to uh, TM62, uh, whether it be metal or, or plastic. 
um, the concern was from speaking to a couple of sappers um, who'd been there in that area previously was they had come across a PMM2, which was linked with, with deck cord running up to a Mon 100, which is obviously a directional fragmentation mine yeah. above ground. So it's all very well as going in and putting a donor charge onto something and, and pulling back and setting that off. But the question is, where's that frag? If there is something above the ground, where's that fragmentation going? I have to find that before I even get in and, and then that right. PMM. Um, and we have seen similar things in different places where you've had tank mines and uh, daisy chained up to artillery shells that have been set off route. Um, so I do generally try and, unless I've got extremely hard cover that I can go to, um, I can't always afford to be able to pull myself back 100 meters. A lot of people will say, I oh, just don't have charged a lot of them, pull back 100 meters. I don't have that option. It might look in the picture that I have that option. I don't have that option. The only place I can pull back to is a hundred meters in a straight line on a flat road with, with no trench and no cover. And yeah. if I want to go and hide by it behind a tree, I need to then clear my route to that tree. So it's, you know, it, it's a balancing act. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, the, just the sheer quantity that we're dealing with, there's not enough detonators. There's not enough debt cord. I can't carry enough in, um, yeah. You know, in, in that area where we're working there, when we first started, um, we were asked to come down and help that unit because they were having to carry ammunition in five kilometers into the forest and Kazibak guys on stretchers, five kilometers out. And then they were losing the stretcher bearers to mines as well. So, you know, it's, um, I know a lot of people look at the pictures and will think, oh, well, I would just do this and I would do that they need to kind of step back a little bit and look at it. I am not with a normal standing military. I do not have helicopter support. I do not have artillery support when I want it. I do not have vehicle support or vehicle access when I want it. I can't just write a, a request to the quartermaster and say, I need 10 kilometers of deck cord and a thousand detonators because I ain't getting it. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of the time, um, if it's, if it's things like tank mines, if I can just pull them off to the side of the road, great. If I can get the fuse out, even better. But otherwise, they just get pulled off to the side of the road. They're marked and they're left. Is it... So actually, um, what's a just a kind of a standard day like for you from, you know, getting up and then uh, going through your day, supporting whoever you're going to support and then uh, finishing it out? Um, so it would, it would really depend who I'm with. Um, I've done a lot of running around the country last year. Um, okay. initially when I came in, I wasn't expecting Ukraine to hold on for more than six to eight weeks. Um, so there was no way for me to be able to get back to my old regiment down in Mariupol because they were in the middle of getting surrounded. Um, so I've, since then I've worked with Ukrainian bomb disposal, uh, police a lot. Um, I've worked with the Army, the National Guard, territorial defense units, um, and military intelligence uh, with their ground assets. So it really depends who I'm working with. If it's the police, it's quite a standardized day. Wake up 6, 6.30, get to the office for 7, quarter past 7 in the morning. And then when we were doing the big bulks of work with them outside of Kiev, we would then drive out to either Hostomol or Butcher or Urban, which had been newly liberated at the time. And you were almost like explosive garbage disposal guys. You would drive down the street and unfortunately all the, the locals had already returned to their homes or they were still living in their homes and they gone, oh, I don't remember planting this with my carrots. Uh, I would take it to the to the main road and leave it next to the bin for you to come and pick up, um, which wow. for the most time was quite helpful. Um, it's very kind of them. I'm not saying that they should do it, uh, but you know, you'd know, you literally drive down the road or there's a, there's a pile of 120 millimeter uh, tank rounds or there's some 152 or uh, a couple of surface to wear. <laughs> <laughs> units, you know, like, oh, perfect. Um, you know, but th that was just pretty much a standard day where you would, you would literally, you would either do these street drives, as I would call them, 
and just go and pick, literally pick stuff up off the streets. Um, and then this would all be taken to a collection point and sorted, where it would then be sent for demolition. And some of the stuff that was in reasonable condition would be then taken back in FFE for, for training purposes. Um, but with places like uh, the forest outside of Hostmall and Hostmall Airport, we were moving at least two to three tons of munitions off Hostel wow. Airport a day. Uh, it was just unreal. I've never, never witnessed anything. That that was the biggest eye opener um, to what this situation was going to be like uh, running off from this. Um, yeah. I don't know how much we moved off, but I think off Hostel Airport alone, that's where Maria um, is the, the largest Ukrainian aircraft. Um, we must have taken 30 to 40 tons off there. Wow. Easy. And I mean, some of this was UXO. Uh, the rest of it was all just blinds from, um, from kickouts. A huge, huge amount of fire damage though. And it, it was just everywhere. You know? Wow. Um, but then with the military, obviously, it's a slightly different ball game, as you know. Um, so you'll be awake till two o'clock the previous morning filling out paperwork and you'll try and get some sleep in amongst uh, the air, air raid sirens. And then an hour later, you'll get a message saying, oh, we need you at six o'clock in the morning. So, so then you just get straight out of bed and start prepping and packing to make sure everything's sorted. Um, so towards the end of last year, um, I've been doing quite a bit of work with Ukrainian military intelligence, um, helping doing mine marking and mapping and clearance for them. So a lot of my time then was spent in and around Bakhmut and Solidar. Um, so that, that changed the tempo quite a bit because, you know, you, would, you were driving in with a, a vehicle. Your hour pretty much had daily working load in the back yeah. of a truck, uh, driving the uh, gauntlet into Bakhmut with the artillery and mortars and grad and everything else. Yeah. That's got to be <laughs> slightly uh... different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. That's a change. <laughs> All right. It sounds like they're the the military is a lot more uh, willing to have you up there right now as yeah. from before. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, it's a couple of things really. I mean, one um, straight after the invasion, Zelensky turned around and said, "Look, we will take any any ex military personnel with any skills that that want to help Ukraine." Um, so obviously you have a lot more foreigners. I, I think I'd never met more than 20, 25 foreigners between 2014 and 2018. Now, you know, English is the first language in, in yeah. or Kremitorsk. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of foreigners around the country at this point, uh, which is, is mostly good. Um, there's a few bad eggs mixed in, but there we go. Uh, the environment breeds it. Um, but for me, because I'd done that three and a half years there, I'd had my social media up and running. I had a lot of connections and a lot of friends from different units. And even the people that I knew who had retired out of the military in those years have all come back to fight. And because okay. they've known I've been back in country, we would get a lot of requests to go and, and give people basic mine clearance training, uh, mine risk education to general infantry units and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So that, that's helped me a lot um, to be able to try and get as much work done across a number of units. And because I've had the time spent on the ground doing what I do, um, it's not that I'm just some random foreigner turning up at a unit and saying, right. you have to do this and you have to do that because it's Western standards or it's NATO standards because the bulk of it doesn't apply. You know, oh, you found an IED or you found a mine phony or do you sit around wait for them to finish their ice cream it doesn't really it doesn't really apply in ukraine because you're just going to sit there forever because the military has no real they they have a small eod capacity within the combat engineer units but it's not a big capacity okay. and they are far too busy to come and deal with the fact that someone found a mine so it's either for a lot of the guys that i meet and end up training the reason why they need the training is because there's no one else for them to do. Gotcha. So you're the one giving them the, here's what's been happening in the new TTPs from the enemy side. 
Yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, TTPs, they are changing weekly. You really? know, the, the training that I gave someone six months ago is not applicable now. I'm not saying all of it, but yeah. there are parts of that that are now not applicable because everything's changing and changing. So we, we keep a, a couple of um, EUD and SAPA um, group chats open and okay. bit with the Ukrainians, and we were literally just expanding all the time. Really? Uh, as far as uh, restrictions that the, the Ukrainian military puts on you being a foreign national, is it, are there many at this time, or have they kind of No, no. Relaxed? Um, Depending on where I'm working um, will depend if I carry a firearm or not. Uh, for the okay. bulk of the time, I'm not. Um, obviously, places like Bakhmut, um, I would, I'm assigned a, a weapon. Um, but that was while I was literally on a contract for that unit. So I'd okay. sign a contract to obviously be everything's above board. I have my paperwork, I have my weapons. And, you know, I, I sign a contract uh, no different to anyone else. So... Um, you know, I can't just run around the country with my gun and do whatever, do whatever yeah. I want, you know, uh, blow it, blowing up landmines left, right and center. Um, you know, I'm, I'm bound by Ukrainian law uh, and will be held accountable if I do something wrong, uh, just like anyone else has signed a contract. Um, but in regards to the UD side of things, I would generally be left alone for the bulk of the time to do what I saw was necessary. Um, okay. Because within the Ukrainian military, for, for most commanders, they do not really understand the difference between an EOD technician a, or a combat engineer or, right. you know, or a humanitarian demeanor. So to them, we're all the same things. The landmines over there, go and deal with them. Uh, <laughs> that's how they see it. You know? um, it yeah. would lead to some tricky little things from time to time because you would get people turn up at where, where we were storing our explosives and they would turn up and go, oh, I just found this. Can you tell me what this is? Yes, some munition, piss off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so you do, you do unfortunately get these, these incidents kind of happen. But now for the, for the bulk of the time, I'm generally left alone and it, and it is for that whole reason that I, I do have the back experience in country. So they, they know that they can just leave me to, to go and do what I do. I come back, give them a report of what I've done for the day. Yeah. As far as um, the what what you're seeing as the the effect of, uh, I guess re trying to reduce the numbers and and, and do uh, open up with with the military, Ukrainian military, allowing you know more people to come in. Is it is it having the impact that's needed or is there still like a, a, a pretty big lack? Um, I think the Ukrainian military letting foreigners in as a whole has been a, a good thing. Um, a lot of foreigners have brought some really good past experience uh, with them and the guys that have been able to kind of switch off from their past military doctrine and you know really soak themselves into the ukrainian military how it works how things operate um what you're not going to get you know? yeah that's a much bigger list than what you're going to get you know <laughs> um and it, it led to a lot of people leaving quite early last year because people you know people were in a sustained firefight calling an airstrike what airstrike <laughs> you know it's uh, it's not coming you know stop wasting your time well you know what i had i had people messaging me from the US and the UK and Canada all wanting to come out and asking for information. And before they've even left their home countries, what weapon am I getting? You know, who makes my body armor? Uh, what type of night vision am I getting? I just shut up and get in a plane. You can and find out for yourself is what I did. Um, but generally the answer is just no, no across the board for anything. Um, but the, sorry, I digress. I mean, the, the guys that have come in have, have mostly been very good. Um, and the ones that have been able to uh, transfer over to training Ukrainians as well, that's the biggest help in my view. Um, but I think it's very good 
if people are going to come into Ukraine and train people, they need to have spent time on the front line to understand the environment. You know, yeah. they need to have spent time in the trenches. They need to have spent time living in basements. You know, it, it's not all MREs and, and water drops. It's, um, you know, sacks of potatoes and bags of rice and buckets of buckets of uncooked chicken, you know. I mean, in the early days in 2014, 2015, we would be expected to go out on reconnaissance with bags of potatoes and bags of rice. And, you know, nice sneaky reconnaissance, right? Start a barbecue, let's get breakfast going. <laughs> you know, right. we, we just looked off chocolate and bloody cute sausages for about six months at a time. Um, a, a little different than what uh, most most people who haven't spent time in that that environment would be used to, and thus it makes sense why they're expecting yeah. the world when surprised when they don't get that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's um, it it has been. I say it has been good. There is uh, a lot of really good foreigners in the country. Uh, it's a shame that some of them feel more of a need to be on the front line than they do mm -hmm. being in a training and training support capacity, because that's where you're going to make the biggest difference in my view. Um, don't get me wrong, you're always going to need people who can just go in and, and run a machine gun really well, or can work in a home be really well, but I, it's that training that makes a difference. How, how is that set up? So if, if uh, someone comes over wanting to, to help support and they, they go, you know, train people, is it, is it, are they training mainly uh, Ukrainian nationals to then go forward or, or how does that set up? Yeah. So, I mean, if it, it depends on how they come in, there's obviously a number of people in country from uh, all sorts of walks of life and government, things like that. It's easy to way to put it, you know, so I see yeah. it. I meet a lot of different people that are over there training people. Um, for the bulk of it, guys will come in and they will join a military unit and then they will try and train in and around the time when they're not on the front line. Um, I do know a number of foreigners that have also come in, they've joined units, they, they've been there, they're fighting, running and going. Um, and then they've stepped back and they've only gone into a training capacity. But what you'll find is these guys will end up being bounced around from unit to unit. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, for some of the military units, the old Soviet doctrine still hasn't gone away. And it's always, the Ukrainian knows better. Why would we listen to the foreign? Which, gotcha. I, I get it. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's just a 50-50 situation where they're kind of right, but kind of not right as well. So, you know, oh, oh, extended line attacks across open fields are not a great idea. But yeah. there is still definitely a few commanders that would consider that as the perfect way to go. Gotcha. Yeah. As far as equipment, uh, how do you guys have everything you need over there? Or, um, and, and is it is it current type equipment? Um, is that directed to the, the EOD be, side, uh, to the EOD side? No, no, we don't. Okay. No. <laughs> um, the answer there. No. Yeah. Yeah. Simple one. Um, detectors are always going to be lacking. Um, but detectors, we also have a problem with now as well. There is obscene amounts of fragmentation in the ground. Mm. So even the combat engineers that we train, um, as much as we try to push them, they they all say the same thing. We will not take take a detector if we're clearing the path for an assault, because generally that for a start they're pretty much going to be under fire when they start that clearance. Okay, it's probably indirect to start with, um, but they can have anywhere between one to three kilometers to have to push through through a suspected mined area, and it will have mines in. It'll be a mix of um, Offensive mines, defensive mines, nuisance mines, lost mines, booby traps, the odd IED, and ridiculous amounts of UXO. Um, and mixed in with all that is just fragmentation. It's it's literally like walking into a scrap metal yard with a detector and turning it on. You know, um, you would spend all day just checking every signal. So 
as much as it pains me, uh, and I wouldn't really class it as the best SOPs, a lot of them, they will not take the detector. What they will do is, okay, my detector weighs five and a half kilos. I'm going to take an extra five and a half kilos of plastic on okay. to damn stuff because, they, again, they're having to hump everything in on foot. Um, and once it gets to the stage where the Russians realize that the Ukrainians are in those tree lines and the Russians open up on them, um, it's you just use a mark one eyeball and just trying to get through this as fast as possible. There's, there's no other way around it. You know, um, I've spoken to a lot of different people uh, from both military and mine action to try and find a happy medium for the combat engineers. There is no happy medium. There is not enough uh, Miklicks in country. Uh, there's not enough Miklicks at all. Yeah. I don't think the manufacturers produce enough. Um, the ones that have turned up in country, um, they've not turned up with any instructions or they've not had an instructor there to be able to train them on it, you know, or there's a part missing or all this stuff's come into country boxed up, but one box has ended up in the north of the country and the parts for it have ended up in the south of the country. And it's, you know, so you've got to go back to basics. Um, but even mine probes, the amount of units that we train and they, they don't even have a, you know, the sappers don't even have a mine probe that, poking around with bayonets, poking around with cleaning rods. Um, it's not acceptable. In right. my view, it's not acceptable because the people leading the, the offensive, the, the counter offensive right now are the combat engineers and they're dying at a rate of one to two every assault. Really? So it's becoming very, very hard to replace these guys, you know? Um, so then you're having guys that are then being sent for four weeks training to military combat engineer establishments. I'm not, I've not been to one of these training centers. I'd like to go just to see what is actually being taught to them. Um, and then they're just being sent back to the front line. Wow. So you can, you can imagine the casualty rate at the moment. It's huge. Yeah. You talked about how there's not enough like vehicles and whatnot. Uh, the, the people that are getting hit, the, the engineers that are up front getting hit, are they, are they dying just from the, the, the initial blast or from not being able to get to higher care quick enough? Um, it's a mix. Um, most of the combat engineers uh, that I've spoken to, uh, that I've spoken about to them with, about their casualties uh, and their KLA, KIA, um, it's a mix. So most of them aren't actually dying on mines. A few of them are dying on mines. Okay. The rest are all being hit by fragmentation or projectiles. Uh, and then again, once the, once the Russians know that the Ukrainians are actually in that area and they're trying to push, then comes in the artillery, then comes in the drone use. Uh, the drones are a big, big problem for the guys now. Um, that, that's so, a question that I was going to have on the, on the drone use. How have you seen that? Cause it just, looking on you know youtube they've it's gotten crazy um, oh, yeah. on the ground how has that increased and where where is it at now I, nowhere is safe anymore yeah the second that you even leave your your holding position or your harbor area to then make an assault or make a reconnaissance it only takes one hobby drone to spot you and that's it the artillery is coming in um and even when we look at kind of Western demining equipment, so uh, I forget the U.S. designation for your Miklik, uh, your vehicle tracked Miklik. Um, I don't know how much it costs. We'll, we'll, we'll pull a figure. We'll say it's like a million dollars. That's a million dollar vehicle covered in high explosive, and some eighteen year old child with a yeah. with a hobby drone and an RPG strapped to it, or a bit of plastic, or a Fog Seventeen, or whatever can now blow that up from the comfort of his bunker a thousand meters away. It's completely right. changed everything. You know? so, Is that how they use them more as they're flying the drones over, finding the spot and then calling in uh, artillery? It's, it's a mix. So on both sides, you have either drones being used for spotting um, and reconnaissance, or you have the, the first person view drones uh, being used as suicide drones. Uh, okay. And I, I've got friends that have left 
um, their infantry units to go and work with other units um, as drone pilots, as Ukrainians. And I know one of them is going for about 10 drones a day. Wow. So, yeah. Which if we look, if, if we imagine this was two Western armies fighting against each other, you know, we're not going to fly 10 predators <laughs> into stuff on a daily <laughs> basis, you know, it's quite an expensive thing. But when a, when a drone's being produced for a couple hundred bucks, you know, it's a very, very cheap, easy way to uh, defeat enemy equipment. And it works. Yeah. Is there any, on the Ukrainian side, is there any counters to those that they have? And you don't have to go into specifics if there is, but... Not so much. Um, so... The West provided Ukraine with a number of the anti-drone guns, but there's not enough of them. Uh, okay. There would never be enough of them for the sheer amount of drones that are being used. And if you look at kind of electronic countermeasures, the problem with that is because the bulk of Ukrainian military is they're not on uh, military radio frequencies. Um, mm. They're all using hobby drones for their own reconnaissance. So if you start to use electronic countermeasures, you're impacting your own side at this point as well. So uh, there has been quite a bit of talk about um, the possibility of getting ECM for the Ukrainians. Um, but I do wonder if that's actually going to be more of a hindrance for them in some places as well. Yeah. If they'll even use it after the first few times that they see what it does on their side, just like you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, but it's the it's the drone use as well, uh, which is it's really really slowing down the the counter offensive in a lot of places as well because the minefields are one thing, um, but the fact that the Russians can throw up a drone that quickly, um, whether it be used for spotting units or whether it be used as a suicide drone, even things for your Kazvak and stuff like that, just bringing a vehicle in quickly to be able to go and pick up casualties if they can make it through the mine belts. Well, at the moment, they're not really driving through mine belts. They're just driving through a, a strip of land on no man's land, which is a mess of mines. Yeah. There's no, you know, it's not a standardized belt by any means. Um, you know, they're still running the gauntlet of being then hit by a suicide drone. Actually it made me think, uh, um, so going through, you know, the, the, demined areas uh how are they able to keep those open so you know you you go through and you clear an area so that you can actually get a vehicle through um is that does that stay open and unmined for a while or is there a a, a back and forth where you either losing that ground or moving on and then now you just have to redo it again because you haven't been there the entire time. Yeah, I mean, it, it really does depend on, on the area. So if if the Ukrainians have punched through an area um, and cleared a route through, whether it just be for personnel or whether it be for vehicles, um, if they can keep that route clear and if they can observe that route, that's great. <clears throat> but sometimes they're punching in, you know, they can be punching in on foot maybe a kilometer and a half, two kilometers at a time. But then for whatever reason, they can't hold that ground, they get pushed back. If the Russians get chance, they will come back in and they will mine areas of that. Um, so what they're seeing on a number of the uh, tree line positions in and around uh, the Bakhmut area, uh, my old 2IC from my unit when I was working with military intelligence has taken over that EOD unit for me. Uh, so he's running that now. And what they're seeing is when they're pushing through a Russian tree line, the the whole tree line will be mined and the outskirts of the tree line running into the fields on either side will be mined. And then there will just be almost like a little rat run for the Russians to be able to use. As the Russians get pushed back, all they're doing is just taking literal rucksacks of PMM2s, or PMM4s, and not even, uh, they're not even being buried, they're literally just being armed and surface laid as they push back and push back. Really? So the Ukrainians can then obviously come through, they'll clear that route through, but if they can't hold that position and get pushed back, when they come to go to that position again, it is just, it's just down to the Ukrainians to go, do I feel comfortable from this point onwards? Do I need to reproof this ground and do it? 
Um, so, I mean, that's one side of it with, with surface laid stuff. Um, but then if we look at the use of um, submunitions of, of AP or AT as well, it's very quickly for it's, it's very quick for the Russians to recede an area, even if it's been cleared before. Yeah, with with all that going on, uh, and you know, especially like you said on the the military side, the sustained operations and and the sounds like massive lack of sleep uh, opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> um, how is the 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 mental health side of things? Um, that's, that problem's probably going to last nearly as long as Ukraine, as the landmine problem is going to last in Ukraine. Um, there is a lot of extremely exhausted human beings in Ukraine right now. Um, the mental health issues that are being experienced by soldiers is quite high. Um, there's not a single person that I know that's worked on the front line that isn't having to deal with some kind of demons, um, whether they be Ukrainian or foreign. Uh, my concern from the Ukrainian side is even though they've started to set up a few mental health centers and stuff, they're going to need a lot more. They're going to need huge amounts of support in this. Uh, I mean, they need huge amounts of support now in this area, but also moving on after the conflict um, they're going to need a lot of help with rehabilitation. Um, and I also wonder about the foreigners as well, because I've, I've, I've dealt with my own trolls um, from my time in Ukraine. And I was fortunate that someone reached out and, and got me the help that I needed at the time. Um, but there's going to be a lot of people that are coming back from the Ukrainian conflict as, as a foreigner that are going to end up back at home. And I don't see how they will receive the help that they need. It's not like being able to turn around to the VA in the US or one of the, one of the charities in the UK because they've obviously not been part of the country's armed forces while they've been doing that. Um, you know, and we're foreigners, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, we're okay. You know, we, we live in slightly better societies in regards to having stuff when we need it. Uh, yeah. For the Ukrainians, it's going to be incredibly hard. Um, the idea that Ukrainians would be able to fund their own counseling if they needed to is very unlikely, uh, just because the price of living there, uh, the, the wages. Um, and the, the issues that people do have are being compounded. So if someone signed up on a military contract, they go and spend two months on the front line in hell, um, they might only be getting one or two week break rotation to go home. By the time they go home, it takes them that three or four days to kind of settle down and, and come out of that combat stress stage. Uh, and then they get a couple of days at home with their family and then they're repacking their bags to go back to the front line and then they're in it again. And there's not enough time to you know, deal with anything at that point. Right. I, even the guys that I know that have been quite badly injured, they've lost limbs, you know, they've suffered quite serious head traumas, chest traumas. Um, the bulk of them have found a way to get, maybe not back to the front line, but at least get back into their old units and work again, because that's the only mental support that they see working for them is to be back in their tribe, which, yeah. which makes perfect sense. You know, it's, it's that whole thing of, um, uh, why do people go back to war? Why do people go to war? You know? Right. On the, uh, thinking about the Ukrainian side, uh, the Ukrainian members, uh, are they open to acknowledging the, the stress that they're being put under? Um, and, and then the, the mental health things that come with that, or are they kind of in that, like, I don't really want to think about that stuff right now. Just head down. Um, I think it, I think if you just ask someone in passing, um, they're going to shrug it off as most of us would, uh, yeah. I think a lot of us are guilty of it. Um, but no, once, once you sit down and, and talk to people or you get to know people, uh, they will quite happily open up about it. Yeah. 
for the <clears throat> the foreigner side, do you think that the, the people coming over there are seeing and doing and being part of far more than they're expecting when they leave here? Yeah, so I think a lot of a lot of people when they when they get on the ground in Ukraine and get into a unit, if that unit is actually doing a lot of work on the front line, um, I think they realize very quickly um, that, you know, that there is no game and you are expected. As a foreigner, you're expected to be able to just get on and do the job. Um, if you've turned around to the Ukrainians and said, I, I've come here, I've got this past experience, I want to help, the Ukrainians will expect you to prove that. Um, you know, they'll want to see it. And I don't want to say that the foreigner is being used for suicide missions, but it will certainly feel like that to a foreigner going in. Really? But if you come in and say that you're ex this and you're ex that, well, they're going to expect you to prove that. And they're not going to give you, they're not really going to give you the time of day until you prove that as well. Um, of course, that leads to not so great situations where you have people coming in that lie about the, the past military experience, they lie about the skills, and next minute they're team leaders, you know, um, or yeah. they are the combat medic, or they're the sniper, or, or they are this and that. And there is plenty of cases of that, unfortunately, and it does put lives at risk. It's, it's already got people killed. Um, there's been a number of cases I know of of people um, having to be kicked out and thrown out of units because they they cannot do the job. They have been found to be lying about their past military service. And that is a very, very dangerous thing. And also it leaves a bad impression on the Ukrainians about the rest of the foreigners that are in country. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's quite tricky though. I, I can imagine that that uh, makes it harder for them to trust the next person that comes in, which yeah. if they do have that actual experience and could be beneficial, it just it's a detriment to everything. Yeah. You've got, you've just, you've got to have a screw loose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, that's EOD. Sorry. You've got to have a lot of screw <laughs> looses to, you know, to turn up in a, to turn up in a country where you are fighting against the Russian army. And as much as we like to say that, yeah, the Russia's on the back foot and everything else, they're still a big army. Yeah. They have a lot of people, you know, and not all of them are 60 or 70 year old granddads or 18 year old children, you know, because I hate to say it, you're 18, you're still a child. Come on. <laughs> yeah. it took me a long time to realize that, but you are, you know, just, just suck it up and deal with it. Um, but if you're going to turn up in a foreign country and say, I was ex special forces this, or, you know, I used to do this and I used to do that. And then you're given a team. And this team looks up to you and then you take them in to an area that's the most bloody fight that Europe's seen since the Second World War. You know, the, the consequences of that are incredibly dangerous. Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, I've seen on, I think you posted a picture of the, a, uh, was it a, um, projectile stuck in a tree. Yes. Is that yeah, on yeah. yours? So yeah. what are some of the, the like craziest scenarios that you've kind of run across and, and had to deal with? So that one, that one was nose first. That one, right. that one was fused first. I've seen one tail first, which is incredible. That's weird. so <laughs> I, I get a lot. I get a lot of comments actually about that picture. It's like, Oh, it's, it's fake. That NATO, NATO Western CIA mercenaries are faking more stuff. I'm like, yeah, okay, here we go. Um, so that that was actually that was a 122 kick out from a from an explosion. Um, so that okay. the Russians had had a uh, a huge position outside of Hostomol. Uh, I when I say huge, we when we arrived with the police, we were told it was 1.5 square kilometers. When we put a drone up and then ran out of batteries and came back with a lot more batteries and put a drone up again, we found out it was literally a five square kilometer really? area of forest, which was just Russian trenches. It That's was crazy. incredible, absolutely incredible. But when it, when the Russians had first started building this, um, it was the paratroopers that came in first. And we only know this because we found the paratroopers positions that when they dug their trenches, they'd also use their silk parachutes as kind of like a base layer over the top of the logs before they 
packed out from the sand and soil and, and camouflaged it. Um, so we found their fighting it. We found their fighting positions. So we're like, okay, this is their fighting position. So we know that in front of this is where the mines are going to be. So we start searching. No mines, no mines. And then in front of you is like a shower area and a kitchen area. It's very strange. And then we just realized they'd obviously expanded to to eventually what it became, which is 5.5K. Uh, but so the Russians had had a lot of munitions um, in uh, vehicles in that area. Now, these were Russians that had punched down from Belarus. So the interesting thing was these vehicles that were blown up which led to kickouts like that artillery round that was stuck in a tree. Um, we were also finding blank ammunition from when they were training in Belarus huh. that they'd driven in with them into Ukraine. So did they actually know where they were going? Would you have taken blank ammunition to Iraq or Afghanistan? That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, but I mean, from that particular area, um, there was a number of projectiles that were stuck into trees, um, which didn't really have what we needed to get them down. So chainsaw and body armor generally worked. Um, <laughs> if we could take the impact into a tree, it was going to take the impact hitting the ground as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. I'm not saying it's an SOP, not saying anyone should do it, but that's how we do it. We were finding, so there was trucks full of uh, 122 millimeter grad rockets there. Uh, we were having to dig down as much as six to eight feet to find these. Because when wow. they'd gone off, they just buried themselves into the sand. Um, but most most of the stuff from there wasn't too crazy. Um, I found tank projectiles, uh, heat tank projectiles that have been stuck backwards um, in trees and things. I found RPGs everywhere. Yeah, forwards, backwards, sideways. You know, vehicles, houses, buildings. Um, just all sorts of crazy chaos, to be honest, you know. Um, I mean, some of the more scary stuff is when I when I sometimes visit units that I've never met before and I ask them where their ammunition storage is and they'll show me. Well, what's all this stuff? Oh, we, we found it. Okay, and why did you bring it back? Well, we don't know, but we found it. Okay, just, just <laughs> I'll take this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that's mine. I don't care. <laughs> it's leaving. <laughs> So, you, know. you don't want this. <laughs> I mean, there was there was a civilian killed, um, a Ukrainian civilian killed down in, I think it was Kherson, and he'd picked up two uh, 3B30 submunitions, which were almost like your little American shape charge submunitions. Okay. So, yeah. uh, same, as, same as what was just sent by the US over recently. And the guy had found two of these, and he was wearing a hoodie and decided to put one in the pocket at the front of his hoodie. And was seen on video camera walking down the on video footage walking down the street swinging the other one by the ribbon. Oh my goodness! You know, and the one in his hand went off, which ultimately sympathetically detonated the one that was in his hoodie as well. Lack of that is... lack of mine risk education uh, countrywide is is a bit of a problem. Uh, that actually brings a good point. Are, are they? trying to do anything about that are they trying to get the public like in a location that's getting close to the fighting say hey these are the things that are out there like please don't do that um i think i think they are i mean the the police uh eud units now have a lot of billboards up as well um, okay. and there's posters that get put up in a lot of places um uh, by the government I'm not too sure if any of the humanitarian mine action organizations are doing anything yet, but they are, I mean, they're, they're doing clearance at the moment and obviously doing mine risk education, but I don't know how far east or south they're actually allowed to go. So when, when, the, when the invasion kicked off, all the mine action groups that were in the east and south of the country got pushed back and had to, I think that they, for the bulk of them, they did actually leave the country for a, for a short while before they came back in. Um, we, like my, my group of people, um, the people that were volunteering with me last year and then the people that I still work with now, um, we run my risk education for uh, military. What we're looking okay. to do as we get our charity up and running is to do my risk education uh, on behalf of the police um, for civilians 
in affected areas. So it's, it's a capacity that we're looking to try and build up in the areas where humanitarian organizations aren't able to get into. So this, this is why we've always tried to give our focus is where can we go in and help where no one else can in, in our capacity. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. You mentioned your, your charity that you're starting to stand up. Um, it, if you'd like to, uh, I'd like to hear about that, what you're, what you're standing up, but then also just in, in the meantime, before then, if there's any ways to, uh, uh, for anybody that's listening that wants to help support what you're doing, how they can go about doing that. Okay, sure. So at the moment, um, my social media is pretty much all through Instagram, uh, Facebook don't like me, so it's, it's Instagram yeah. for now. <laughs> um, so I, I am able to take donations at the moment, but I can only, I can only really take them into my private bank account or into PayPal, um, which is, is not the best option, but it's the only way I have at the moment, which is a, an easy way to convert stuff into Grievner in Ukraine if we need to, um, or be able to use PayPal to then purchase equipment out of the country and then ship it in. Um, I can certainly take hard donations as well. Uh, we do have numerous people from around the world that have donated uh, both medical, uh, medical humanitarian and EOD equipment to us, um, depending on the amounts and sizes and everything else, we can generally get them collected in whatever country they are in, um, or have them shipped to a specific country. And then we organize to infill them into Ukraine. Um, I have been doing larger, uh, transfers of kit, which has been government to government level. Um, so speaking with EOD units across the European Union and then having them pass on surplus equipment uh, via uh, a contact, well, via me um, as a contact between the Ukrainian police EOD units and then the EOD units providing stuff. So even if it's, you know, at the moment I'm in the US, obviously, uh, what I've been trying to do is, is reach out to different police departments and stuff like that. Anyone that would have any spare UD equipment, even, even if it has to be done on a, on a government transfer level, that can all be fixed. That's, that's, that's just simple paperwork. Um, but my partner and I and a couple of friends are in the middle of setting up a charity now. Uh, so running that out of the US. And then we are setting up a, an NGO in Ukraine as well to continue the work that we do. Um, so I met my partner in Ukraine. She's a, a paramedic and firefighter. Uh, okay. so I met her in, in the east of the country. Um, and we've, we've both seen um, during the time that we've, we've been there um, what the shortcomings have been for a number of organizations. Uh, it's not to say that any of these organizations are doing things the wrong way. It's just we see much better ways to streamline um, and pull resources to be much more efficient. Yeah. So that that's what we're working on at the moment. So the bulk of that will be to support the Ukrainian police EOD units um, in um, mostly marking and mapping and clearance of whether it be farmland areas or, or newly liberated villages or anything like this. Um, and then to be able to pro help to provide them with more equipment um, and also at the moment, we've just started a project with them to <coughs> train uh, their EOD technicians in English language skills, um, because you have Ukrainian EOD techs going to Europe at the moment uh, for okay. training. And you also have numbers of foreigners coming in as, as advisors to help with them and stuff. So build, not just building up their EOD capacity, but building up the, the language capacity to be able to work with foreign nationals better. Um, and from the medical side, um, it's the the main goal at the moment would be to provide all the UD techs uh, that are working the police UD techs uh, with medical support because at the moment they're having to take away from the national grid of medical, um, which limits the amount of ambulances available for other jobs. So that's that's an area that okay. we see that we can we can fill for them quite easily. Um, and then on top of that would be the normal medical work that my partner would do, uh, which is the transfer of wounded soldiers uh, from the, not from the front line, but from CCPs back to trauma stabilization points or back to hospitals. So we've got 
we've got quite a bit going on. Um, yeah. The organization is called Prevail. Um, we're, we're nearly set up. We're not, we're not completely set up on paper yet. So I've been holding off driving that on, fine, on social media until it's, until it's yeah. completely done. But we're pretty much there. And then once that's set up, um, we've, we've been asked by the police to go into a, a legal cooperation with them as well. So that would leave us as the only small organization to have that small cooperation with them. So I'm hoping that that will help drive drive the funding at that point. Yeah, that would be great. Um, on the uh, medical and EOD side, you said hard donations are obviously welcome as well. Um, yeah. What kind of equipment supplies are you, do you most need? Okay. Um, so to, to go from the medical side first, um, the, the number one thing is, is IFAC components. It's, okay. it's immediate trauma medicine. Um, whether it be tourniquets, chest seals, decompression needles, large bandages, hemostatic gauze, um, Give me a sec, because my yeah. paramedics in the other room. What else do you need? Just real tourniquets. Real tourniquets, yeah. That's 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 the most okay. honest one, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we do we do get a lot of fake stuff coming to country, unfortunately. Uh -huh. um, the 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 one benefit of that is we're able to pass on uh, fake tourniquets um, to training providers. Okay. So it stops them using, you know, real cat sevens or real cat sixes for actual training. Uh, so that makes a big difference, but pretty much if it goes in an IFAC, we need it. Uh, we need as much as you can get hold of. Uh, one, one thing that keeps coming back to me, people keep saying is, but Ukraine's already had a hundred thousand IFACs or it's had 200,000 IFACs. You must have enough. No, we don't. If we say the casualty rates, a hundred people a day, KIA, if we say that there's then 500 people a day injured, that's 600 IFACs a day become partially damaged, lost, or obsolete yeah. every day. So, it, it, you know, it's there's, there's good reasoning why we, we need so much of it. Um, and then for the ambulance care, um, pretty much everything uh, that, you can, that goes into the back of an ambulance you know, for, for a paramedic is, what, is what's needed on that side. I stay out the medical side. It's not, really my, it's not my fault. Um, from the EOD side, need anything and everything. Um, okay. We cannot get enough mind probes. We cannot get enough detectors, hook and line kits. Um, there is becoming more of a need now for non-metallic tools, uh, whether that be excavation tools or non-magnetic, uh, non-metallic knives, scissors, um, flashlights, line lasers, tripwire feelers, just decent day bags. Decent, okay. decent rucksacks, uh, compartmentalized, almost like small uh, trauma med bags, um, right the way up to drones and robots. Um, I'm hopeful uh, there's a gentleman reaching out the next day or two that's got a small robot here for us. These are just things that we cannot afford to get. Um, you know, I, I don't have the money. I can't go out and spend... I couldn't spend 10 grand on a robot if it was 10 grand, you know, or a little bit more than that. Uh, yes. <laughs> and people, people do turn around to me and say, well, what do you need a robot for? To be honest, I, 99% of the time, I would not use a robot. I would prefer to just, is it safe? Can I go down range and deal with it? Yes, I will. Um, but with the sheer amount of cluster munitions that we have um, and anti-personnel seismic mines, um, we're much safer to be able to fly a drone over it, assess the area, assess what's in it, Take a, take a robot, take a donor charge down, go, bip, done. Yeah, so it, that, it's, it's that everything. Sense. Yeah. So, I, I know there's huge piles of, of EOD kit stashed away in the US somewhere that's never going to get used again. I just do not know how to get access to it. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for for those that do have something and and want to donate when I want to get it to you is the easiest way to get a hold of you through your Instagram account or uh, either through Instagram or through that email. I'm happy for that. Okay. For that email to be shared. Okay. I'll make sure I have both of those in the description to you so that people okay. can reach out. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to, to cover that, that I didn't ask you about? Um, 
I just thank you to everyone that has supported Ukraine. You know, um, between 2014 and 2018, we didn't see huge amounts of support coming out. Uh, the, I started to receive, after 2015, I started to receive a bit of notice for what I was doing there. And I would have EODT text reach out to me and send me bits of kit. Um, I'd have people send me bits of beer money. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it, it helped. Um, <laughs> you know, but the the support that Ukraine's been getting since the invasion, and because everything's been so mainstream about it, or at least it was for a couple of months, um, the the level of support has been phenomenal, and certainly from the the UD community that's that's reached out to support me, or even just. I get a lot of people just messaging, just asking questions. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always grateful for their support and for their insight. Uh, constructive criticism is always welcome as well. Uh, I say that to all the armchair UD techs that <laughs> do nothing but argue. Constructive criticism is fine. Um, I'm happy to talk to anyone most of the time. Um, what I would say, because I do have a lot of, Obviously, I know there's going to be a lot of EV techs listening to this podcast mostly. Um, I have had a number of people reach out as single individuals asking for information and stuff like that. I am happy to do that to a certain extent. Um, but if people want a proper rundown on the Ukrainian situation, if they want to reach out to me on a professional uh, level, then I'm sure that we can arrange something from a more professional point of view of being able to meet up with specific EUD units uh, across the US. Uh, I'm going to be bouncing in and out at the moment. Um, so I, I will be in and out of the US. Um, and to be able to go and sit down and, and chat with people, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, <coughs> I think even EUD techs that might never get a chance to go to Ukraine um, need to pay attention to what's actually going on on the ground there because all the tactics from different conflicts that we've seen over the last 22 years and longer are all amalgamating in Ukraine and the technology is really speeding up and getting quicker and quicker while we're doing it. So the, the mine, the UXO, the booby trap threat, the IED threat, the drone threat, it's all coming together in Ukraine. And the question will be when the conflict finishes there finally, where will all that knowledge and information then start being used? Will it start being used in other conflicts? Of course, Will there potentially be bad actors that would then use some of those skills learned back in their home country or other countries? And that's something as bomb disposal technicians, I think we really need to look at as well. Yeah, I would I'd 100% agree. That's uh, sometimes that gets lost in in the conflict. But yeah, thinking about hey, where does this go after? 100%. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I really appreciate you uh, taking your time and, and talking with me about this and uh, try and get the word out as much as I can to, to get you guys some more um, hard donations, you know, and then anything that can on this side. Um, if, if there's anything that uh, I can do on this side from, you know, this standpoint, feel free to reach out anytime. Um, okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I mean, even, as I say to most people um, that, that do contact me on, on Instagram saying, how can they help? You know, just just a like and a share, just the more people that we can get involved. Um, it is one of the, the main reasons why I run my Instagram, which is, is a complete bane in my life. Um, it's just to, just to share awareness, you know, and yeah. I, I generally won't hide anything on there unless it's from an OPSEC point of view that I won't, there's a lot of stuff I won't share because of that generally anything else good or bad you know it i understand that it works as as a good platform to to help get the knowledge and information out of what's actually going on on the ground as opposed to what our media would tell us right wait you, you mean there might be a, a, a difference between what the media says and <laughs> Could never confirm nor deny that <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Echo Oscar Delta podcast, where we talk to Navy EOD techs and hear the stories that they want to share.